On April 26, 1986, a catastrophic nuclear accident took place at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukraine, which was part of the former Soviet Union. An explosion and fire released large quantities of radioactive particles into the atmosphere, which spread over much of the western portion of the Soviet Union, as well as through Europe. On that fateful day, David Gurevich, our guest on today's podcast, was living with his wife Ina and their four-year-old son less than 80 miles from where the explosion took place. In the days, months, and years that followed this tragic event, many lives were affected by the radiation fallout, including the life of David's young son. Thyroid cancer in children was one of the main health impacts that resulted from the Chernobyl disaster, and David's son was not immune. Within a few years, David and Ina would find themselves relocated in America to start a new life as they sought medical attention for their son, who had thyroid problems as a result of the accident. This is the amazing story of the journey of one man, raised in a Jewish family yet an atheist to the core, who traveled across an ocean to begin a new life with his family and find healing for his son. What he found, in addition to the things that he sought, was a confrontation with the living God that would forever change his life. You're listening to Inspiring Faith, a podcast created to inspire, challenge, stretch, and grow your faith in God to new levels, no matter where you are on your journey with Him. My name is Lorraine Varela, and I'm your host. I'm so excited to have David Gurevich here, and we are going to talk about his amazing testimony of how he came to faith in the Lord. So, welcome, David. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Good. I'd like to start with just a little bit about your background. Can you just tell me where you were raised, where you grew up, and just a little bit about what life was like in the country of your birth? I was born in the former Soviet Union. That That's where I spent 31st years of my of my life. Well, it's a Soviet Union, it's a communistic society. We knew nothing about God. Well, at least I didn't know anything about God. It was surprising for me to hear that David didn't believe in God because he was Jewish. Raised by Jewish parents in a Jewish home in a city where 40% of its population was Jewish at the time of the Second World War. Yet he did not attend a synagogue as there wasn't one in his city. He didn't believe in God and yet still, he found himself practicing the religious traditions of his heritage. We were so much affected by the, the culture we grew up in. Uh, nobody talks about God. We had some Jewish traditions, but they're just traditions. they hardly connected to any faith. My gra- I remember my grandmother, would, she would, uh, on Passover, she would throw everything out of the house and she would get two boxes of matzah and eat only these. And I would ask, what is it? She said, I don't know. My father did it. (laughs) My father did it. I remember since I was a child, and I'm doing this. But she didn't know what she's doing. I was not really anti-God because uh, I was sure that there is no God. There is, it's not really much to talk about. I was not fighting against God because I knew that there is no God. Nobody to fight with. We didn't even talk about it in our, in, our, in my community, in my, my family, my friends. Uh, I believe that uh, everything must be proven by the formula. Everything must be explained by the formula, by the science. And if something science cannot explain, it belongs to the fairy tale. There's a good reason David valued logic and reason so highly. He held a degree in mechanical engineering and went on to further study in patent research. He was working in this field in 1986 when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster took place just miles from his home, a disaster that would change the course of his life. I wondered what it was like to live through something so catastrophic, so I asked David to share with me what had happened from his vantage point. Did you witness the explosion? You don't see it, but you. But we sense some changes in the, in the atmosphere. It was strange wind uh, in the day. 
Everybody noticed some strange change in the, in the air, but we didn't know what it was. Surprisingly, it took days for David and the people of his city to find out what had taken place at Chernobyl. It was only after the traveling radiation particles had set off alarms at a nuclear power plant in Sweden that the government alerted the people to the accident that had occurred. David and Ina continued to live in the Soviet Union for the next few years, unaware of the growing health risks to themselves and especially to their young son. As a result of the Chernobyl disaster, their son did develop thyroid problems. So in 1989, three years after the explosion, they left the country of their birth and came to the United States, settling in the Seattle area where they found medical care and treatment for their son. In Seattle, David found a job working at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, where he became friends with a co-worker who came from a very different background than his own. We were very different. He was, uh, was from Detroit, and he used to be in a gang. He was involved in drugs. I don't know a lot about that, but he, he escaped, actually. He ran away from Detroit because it, it was, uh, at certain points, it was even dangerous for him to be there. So these two men from very different backgrounds were now working together in Seattle, sharing a very small room. David, the Jewish atheist, and his new friend Mark, a former gang member who had turned his life around when he became a believer in Jesus Christ. I remember we got our first paycheck and he, he, he took this check and he said, uh, Jesus, thank you for this money. And I said, Mark, you work all, mo- all month for this money. Why would you thank somebody? He said, no, I give thanks to God because he made it possible for me to make this money. So I said, as for me, I thank myself because I was working and I, <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> so that's how we started our conversation. And he said, you don't believe in God? I said, no, why would you believe in God? And who is God? And that's how we started. He was very uneducated. He hardly could spell his name. But when it, but I remember when we were talking about God and Bible, he was his arguments were very strong, and many things made sense to me. I was kind of interested in this. Even though David was impressed by Mark's knowledge of the Bible and listened closely to what Mark shared, he still had a hard time believing in the reality of God. But uh, he was trying to explain to me, I did, still didn't, didn't believe, I still didn't accept the idea of, of somebody over there. And, uh, and he said, one day the Lord will come to you and he will explain himself. And that's what happened. Just a few weeks following that conversation, David did have an encounter with God, just as Mark said he would. It was a night like any other. David went to sleep, but in the early morning hours he was awakened by a physical weight, a heaviness that left him unable to move. The first experience is this heaviness came upon me. I, I, I woke up and I experienced this heaviness I've never experienced before. It was so heavy, it was so that I couldn't move anything. Not even I, I wanted I was I didn't know what was it and I wanted to I wanted to call my wife and I I opened my mouth, but the sound was not coming out of my mouth. It was very new experience for me. It was I was totally paralyzed. I couldn't move any finger. I couldn't move my tongue. And, and all of a sudden, this picture opened for me. I saw myself standing in the complete darkness. It was so dark, that it, so thick and dark that you, you almost can touch this darkness. And it was for miles around me, nothing else but darkness and darkness. Then the beam of light was very narrow, maybe like a little bit wider than my shoulder, maybe one meter, uh, was coming down on me straight from, from above. When I look up, I saw a man in white clothing, and I realized that it's, it's Jesus, Yeshua. How I knew it, I don't know. You know, in this, in this experience, in spiritual experience, you have this understanding, it's coming to you. you. You don't even know where it's coming from. But it's all of a sudden, it's so clear, it's clear to you that it's Him. And from Him, out of Him was coming this beam of light. And above Him was 
a cloud. It was a beautiful cloud. I, I remember the color of this cloud. I've never seen these colors. It's not white, it's not blue, it's something in between, I don't know. And understanding came to me that all this darkness that surround me, it represent evil and, and sin we're living in, I was living in. And this darkness was going all the way up to the, out to the Jesus, but not touching him. And understanding came to me that, that this truth, that this beam is, that is coming out of him is the truth. And I was concerned as soon as I understood it, because I was looking for the, for the truth. I was looking for the meaning in life. And, 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 I, and I realized that, that's, 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 that, that I found it. And then another concern to me came that uh, this darkness, it's so, so much of it can, can kind of, can stop this beam because it's so unproportional, larger. And I asked this question, I said, Lord, I asked him, Lord, already, I said, Lord, I'm worried about this beam, I found it, I don't want to lose it again. And he said, don't worry, he's going to take care of this. And he pointed to his cloud, to his father. And after that I woke up and uh, this vision changed my mind, changed my philosophy, changed my life philosophy instantly. It was not like I was studying, I was thinking, no. I was studying and thinking before, I came to nothing. I read a lot of books and they, nobody has an answer, but, uh, but after this picture, as soon as I came to my senses, as soon as this picture disappeared, as soon as this, this weight of heaviness came off me, my uh, life philosophy changed right away. In the morning I said, you know, I believe in God. That's the first thing I told her. And his name is Jesus. You see, for me personally, some, a lot of Jewish people, they, have, they accept the idea of God. But Jesus and the Son of God, as the Messiah of Israel, they're struggling with this. I didn't even struggle with this a second because to me the whole idea of God was fairy tale. But, uh, but when I realized that, that there is a living God, and he operates through his son, Jesus, I didn't struggle with this idea. Uh, it didn't bother me at all. When David went back to work the following day, the first thing he did was tell Mark about his experience with the Lord. Mark could already see that something significant had happened in David's life. For the first time, David was now open to reading the Bible. So Mark bought him a brand new Bible to read and to study. For the next maybe six, seven months, I was reading Bible like you know, like hungry man who was not eating for, for many days. He's not eating, he's consuming food. So that's the way I was with the Bible. The way I came to the Lord, I believed everything what's in the Bible. The Bible says that the great fish swallowed this man. I believed it. If it says that man swallowed this great fish, I would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was so, it was so interesting because I just couldn't understand where my logic when? It was gone. It was totally gone. So after God arrested David's attention in such a powerful way through a night vision, David spent hours seeking after him and his truth as he would pour over the Bible. And in the night, the presence of the Lord would often come and rest on David, just as it had in that first encounter, a time that God opened up revelation to David through open visions. After that, I would say once or maybe even twice a week, I had pretty much exactly the same experience. Always towards the morning, maybe 5, maybe 4.30 in the morning, this heaviness came upon me, but I was not scared of this anymore. <laughs> and I would see some things. I would see things that, I, that I've never seen before. I remember the Lord even came to me on my birthday because I, I invited him. I said, my birthday is coming, Lord. I invite all my good friends and best friends. I was a baby believer. I was so naive. And looks like he li and, and he likes this when we are like children. And I said, Lord, I invite everybody, but, and you are my God. How can I not invite you? And he, and, and he did come. 
Do you remember what happened on your birthday? What he showed you? Oh, uh, it was not. He was not like an actual birthday, but during that right. night, like like right. four thirty or five in the morning, again this experience, physical experience of being, I would say, isolated and paralyzed. So he can have all my attention because I was paralyzed. Uh, and then I saw him in a vision or in a dream. I don't even know. It's hard to describe what this this condition. But then I saw his sil silhouette. How you say it? Mm -hmm. Silhouette. Silhouette. Yeah. And I was. I'm trying hard to look at his face and see his face because uh, you know you're trying to have a contact, but I can't. And then I said, Lord, how come I don't see your face? I don't see your eyes. And 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 he said to me, as much as you have faith, this much you see me. And I said, oops. I was disappointed because I have a little faith, but then I was rejoicing because he did come to my birthday. <laughs> As David's faith in the Lord began to grow, the visions that had once been so frequent now began to become rare, until they were nearly gone. I asked David how he felt when he came to this realization that God had changed the way he was communicating with him. Well, remember when they, before they crossed the Jordan, the miner was falling down on them. They didn't do anything to have this food, but then they, as soon as they crossed the Jordan, they have to work for this. So as we as we become more mature, the Lord is Lord is changing the language, the way He communicates with us, because now He wants me to walk by not by visions, <laughs> not by sight, but by faith, by by sensing Him, by understanding Him, by knowing His character, like children. You know, as you, you have different children, different age, you speak a different language with them. During the years that David lived as an atheist apart from life in God, he struggled with a major fear of death. When he came to faith, that fear was broken through the reading of God's Word. David read in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, these words. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Through these words, the power of the fear of death was broken in David's life. If life ends with death, it has no purpose, it has no meaning. That's why when I came to this scripture, it was so liberating for me. I was, I was set free by the Word of God. And that's what the Word of God does to you if you really believe in this. I asked David to close with some words of advice to share with those who had not yet experienced God in a powerful or dramatic way like he had. What did he feel was important for people who are seeking after God to know? In 1 John chapter 4, it's a very good verse, chapter, verse 16, I think, it says, and we, we know the love of God and we believe in it. So we have to experience, we, you don't have to experience God's healing, but you must experience God's love. You must experience God's mercy. It's not, it's not optional, you must know God is about knowing Him. It's about experiencing. It's about no, not knowing the theology, not knowing the Bible. It's about knowing Him. Know Him is His love. So experience love like young wife experiencing, experiencing the love of her husband. Exactly experiencing. It's not emotional knowledge. It's a knowledge of experience. And we must believer must have this experience otherwise he does not know God he knows of him but not him and that's important if you have this experience then you will be solid like a rock because if it's in your mind if you some you have some theology or argument or or conclusion somebody will come with the better arguments and will convince you away from God but if you have experience I know that God loves me. Why? Because the Bible says, yes, because Bible says, but because I know I am speaking out of experience. And then it's a different story. So let's say we're speaking today to somebody who 
has knowledge of God, mm-hmm. who believes that they have experienced God, but not in the way that you're describing. Do you feel like it's wrong to ask God to have that knowledge no. in that experience? No, he of should him? be asking. He should be seeking. He said, "Seek, and you will find him." Uh, no, you have to press forward and and seek. Taste, Bible says, taste how good he is. You have to taste it. So when, like, there is a difference when you taste some fruit and then you read it, you read about the taste. You see the difference? So when you taste it, oh, I like it, and then I'm going to eat it. That's the, that's the same way with God. You, you have to taste how good God is. And then when you taste and you like it, then you move forward and get going deeper into, into this relationship. So if somebody has uh, like uh, intellectual knowledge about God, maybe it's a good start. Maybe that's the way he grew up in the Christian family. Actually, I'm concerned a lot about people who grew up in a Christian family as children because they grew up and they, that's what they have, most of them. They have intellectual knowledge because they've heard from their parents. They, they went to church all their life uh, and they know Bible and they know all these stories and they know how to pray. They, they know pretty much everything except God. <laughs> so I would encourage these, these people to uh, seek the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me. Like Moses, Lord, show me your glory. Be persistent like Jacob. I will not let you go until you reveal yourself to me in a very special way. So some wrestling with God is in order. Oh yeah, it's, it's good. You wrestle with God and ask for more and he, will, he likes that. What would you say to somebody who was raised in that type of environment in the Christian home and was <clears throat> taught that, well, you know, God just doesn't speak in that way today? Well, praise God that you were raised in the Christian family. and It's good, but, uh, but you, just, you just went into the water up to the knee. Go deeper. Go deeper. <laughs> you can't swim if you're just in the shallow waters. You have to go deeper. So I would encourage you to seek. And that's what the Lord wants you to seek. And he will, he will meet you halfway. Halfway? <laughs> Even... Sometimes all the way. <laughs> <laughs> all the way, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, David. It was really good talking to you this oh. morning. Appreciate your time. Praise the Lord. Yeah. As David finished sharing his heart for others to experience and deeply know the love of God, a friend of our family was visiting and happened to hear his testimony. Kaylee is a beautiful young woman who has a heart passionate for Jesus and musical talent that is just incredible. When Kaylee was 14 years old, she wrote a worship song that perfectly fit the theme of what David was talking about, so I gave Kaylee a guitar and asked her to play her song for us. Here's Kaylee Keough. Today's devotional encouragement is called Faith to Draw Jesus Back. It begins, As these days draw to a close, it is more important than ever to finish strong. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God is looking for faith to rise up, faith to draw him back. He is not coming back to establish his kingdom so that he can rule and reign alone. He is coming back to a people who have been running hard after him a people who have longed for him above every other pleasure this world has to offer. 
a people who have embraced holiness and who exhibit his heart of love, a people from every nation, race, tribe, and tongue, from every age and stage of life. Now is not the time to go back to sleep, to rest, to return to your own pleasure. Wake up! Open your eyes and look around. See what Jesus is doing so you can get on board and do his works as you speak his words. Warn those who are in danger of perishing apart from him. Love fervently. Pray constantly. Today is your day to watch, to see, to listen, and to speak out his words of life. I find a rest And as I think about all you've done And I am blessed Thanks so much for listening. I'm really glad you stayed with me to the end. Until our next episode, may God bless you and surround you with his peace. Shalom. Thank you.